and a half. So I have a lot of passion about this subject, and I really hope to inspire you today uh, to learn how to be a responsive parent, to be able to connect with your child, and be able to read their cues so that you can be responsive to their needs. Because a lot of this work, doing attachment parenting, is about trusting your instincts, your inner life, your thoughts, your feelings, your intentions, your own memories associated with your own behavior and understanding their meaning in order for you to understand your child. So in your handout, uh, we'll go to the first page. And as you can see, you will see that I have structured it that the word her relates to the parent, the mother, the father, the caregiver, whoever is in relationship with that child. And the child is referenced as him, just so it's clear for you. So let's start by talking about the attachment relationship key points. Now this all, what I'm teaching you today is based on Daniel Hughes' book, Attachment Focused Parenting. He is a leader in the field of attachment and trauma and has worked with many children and families touched by adoption and foster care. And he has done extensive research and I highly uh, regard his work. So I'm very excited to share with you his key points about attachment-focused parenting. So with page one, the attachment relationship key points. It is connection and not correction, which is the ability to guide a child in a positive manner without sacrificing his autonomy and individuality. So what does that mean? That's a lot. It's about connecting with the child and not correcting them with their behavior. Because what we want to do is really honor the child's inner world and get them to think on their own two feet in a situation so that they can build their own individuality, make choices on their own, and think through situations. Attachment parenting does this so well when we're effective at doing it. It really teaches children how to be more independent rather than dependent. Because what happens is, I think there's a myth that attachment parenting is about creating dependency. Well, it is about dependency because what we're doing is we're breeding independency. And this requires a reciprocal relationship from the parent and the child. So it's a give and take. And you are on the same level because that breeds respect. And it is wise that parents walk with rather than stand above their child. And this is engaging them in conversations, telling them stories. And the research is very clear that securely attached children do not become dependent on others as adults. So doing this type of parenting is really effective in the long haul. And it's really about the process and not looking at results now and really being able to stay with your child during their behavioral episodes and meet their needs. So if you meet your child's needs to feel safe and secure, the child will develop self-reliance skills and resiliency. So how do you do this? Okay, the important there it's very important to have emotional safety and communication. And this is about creating structure, routines and rituals and Free time tends to be anxiety time, especially for kids with trauma histories, because anxiety time is too many choices, and they have difficulty making so many choices on their own. So they'll obsess about the choice, they'll have little, little confidence in their choice, and then they'll have regrets. And a term that I'm going to talk about is shame, and shame is so important to understand that the kids that we're dealing with, especially those in foster care and adoption, are holding on to a lot of shame. And they do blame themselves repeatedly for not getting things right. So that's why it's important to stay connected and not correct them because the child will perceive that as they're doing something wrong and shame tells them that there is something wrong with them. So then they will self-blame themselves, and it keeps them in the state of pervasive shame. But I will talk more about that later. Now, one of the things that I just want to point out is 
It's important to understand the brain and how the brain works. And part of emotional safety is about keeping, maintaining a state of regulation with your child so the child is not going into a stress state. If they're going into a stress state, then the, literally the hormone, stress cortisol, gets flooded into their system and they can't connect with us. So we want to be able to keep our stress levels down while we're trying to maintain contact with our children. So the second part of emotional safety is it's really important for the parent to maintain a positive, effective tone, which influences the child rather than letting the child's tone influence the parent. And I know this is hard when we're dealing with highly reactive children. However, reacting to a child's negative state only creates a vicious cycle, which we know creates this cycle of push and pull, push and pull, and it's a never-ending cycle of dysregulation and becomes more problematic in your attachment to that child. So when I say that positive effective tone, tone is really important because tone is nonverbal. It can be stated in, you could be angry with your child and state, you know, I'm angry with you. What happens is when a child hears the anger out of a parent's voice, they perceive the parent as threatening, and most of these kids are living in survival mode. So if they perceive the parent as threatening, the dynamic in the relationship will not be safe. And then a parent is not able to be influential in that moment. So tone is really important. Um, it is okay for a parent, and I'm a follower of the Post Institute and Beyond Consequences and the Stress Model. It is very important for a parent to relate their feelings about a certain situation. If the child is not listening, they can say, you know, I'm feeling really angry right now, but not projecting it on the child. You can state your anger, which is important for you to help you stay regulated as a parent. But for the child, it's not effective to say, I'm angry at you. I'm angry at what's happening right now. I'm angry that we can't put the clothes away together or whatever it is that you're setting a limit about, that you're angry at that, but not angry at the child, as this will not influence the attachment, but it will distance and can cause more, more difficulty and more shame with the, within a child. So... Number three is it's crucial to respond to the strengths that underline the child's symptoms and problems. And we will be getting to that, how do you respond to a child's strengths, and that's on page four. Um, and we'll get to that later, but it's, I'm going to teach you how to do that, focus on strengths and vulnerabilities. So number four is, Daniel Hughes talks about not assuming motives behind behavior because what we're creating is a negative feedback loop. And a negative feedback loop is where the dynamic is the parent sets a negative tone, the child re reacts in a negative tone, and then we've got this feedback loop that's negative where a parent assumes, oh, you're, he's just trying to manipulate me or he just wants attention. He's not trying, he's not lazy, as you can see here. He just wants to make me mad. And if that is the case, the best way to reduce acting out is for the parent to control their anger. Or we hear this a lot, he's just trying to get away with something. The problem with this, in assuming motives behind a child's behavior, is that what happens is we make the motive more prominent. And when we make it more prominent, we're creating it when it may not have been present before because we're not understanding that all behavior is a form of communication of an unmet need. And if we're not able to see and move past the assumption you're doing this to manipulate me, then that's all we're going to see, and that's exactly what the child will do. They will continue to manipulate. So what's important is number six is lectures 
are not effective because what actually happens is we are actually educating our child to comply with authority rather than developing his own meaning about an issue or event. This, in attachment theory, does not develop autonomy. What we want to do is create a storytelling tone which conveys an attitude of acceptance of the child, of their own individuality, which will breed respect. It Lectures tend to create criticism, uh, defensiveness. It's not respecting a child's point of view. And that's why I think there's a big myth in attachment parenting that we are being too permissive in attachment parenting. And the child needs to respect the parent. But when a parent truly respects the child and meets them at the same place, we actually encourage a non-defensive response. And the storytelling mode conveys the storyteller's experience and the experience of the listener, and there's an engagement in the relationship. And this is about connection and not correction. Because again, these kids are living in pervasive shame, and it's like a bubble that they live in. And that's their experience. And whenever they feel corrected, we, we, we get stuck in this place of being at a distance with them. And we want to be able to join them in their shame and experience it with them. And I'll talk more about how we do that. So number eight is, and these are all points in how to create emotional safety in communication. Number eight is having a give and take dialogue that involves understanding and having empathy. And this reciprocity does not weaken parental authority. It enhances it, like I have been talking about. Number nine is do not ask a child why they are refusing to do whatever limit you have asked them to do or stopping something. Because being frustrated with their lack of answer will actually cause them to feel corrected and then they go back to that shame that there's something wrong with them and then it disrupts the connection. So the way to repair any communication, if you find yourself correcting a child and you're going into lecture mode, because this is traditional parenting. We expect that these kids can be parented just the way we were parented. But unfortunately, with children who have trauma histories, they cannot be parented the same way because their brains are reacting a different way. and they are not feeling safe in the world, so we need to provide that safety for them so that they can feel secure. So if you're feeling like, oh boy, I just am doing lecture mode, pause, acknowledge that it begins, change the tone to a storytelling tone, and invite the child's perspective of the event. You can take a break if there are strong emotions. You can acknowledge the emotion and say, you know what, I need a time out. It's the parent who takes the time out, not the child. And I don't know how much of uh, how many of the callers today have studied beyond consequences, but it's so important to understand the brain and why timeouts are not effective because it actually causes more of a psychological abandonment for these kids. And what these kids need is more time in with the parents rather than time out. So it's the parent who takes a time out reflects and regulates their own state so that they can come back and talk again and hear the child's perspective of the event. Uh, one of the things that I teach kids uh, in my psychotherapy practice is eye messages. And this is important for everyone because eye messages state what we're feeling and we're able to focus on the behavior and the parents and we can each focus on each other's thoughts and feelings and reasons for being concerned. So here are some examples. A parent may say, I am angry when you tease our dog. I want her to receive the same respect that everyone else receives in this house. It is okay for a parent to give a child an eye message. It models for a child healthy emotional communication. Also, I think it is really important to help your grandmother rather than going out. She won't ask, but I know she needs some help. 
So conveying to a child that it's okay to have feelings and that it's important to express them because Helene Timpone talks about this. What doesn't get expressed will be through the through language, through the mouth, will be expressed through the hands and the feet. So we want to teach these kids effective ways of expressing themselves. And number four is focus on the child's interests, vulnerabilities, and strengths to initiate a discussion. And I'll be going into that uh, in a, the next page. So let's talk more about establishing safety when disciplining and setting limits. Now, again, I'm talking about safety. It is so crucial to understand how important emotional safety is for these kids because, again, they are living in a daily survival mode. They do not want to disappoint their parents, so they are working at their greatest capacity to not mess up. So when they do mess up, or in their perceived understanding, in their bubble, they expect us to react to them, to correct them, to keep them in that state of shame. What they need for us is to respond to their mishap, to their mistake, in a loving and responsive way so that they can internalize having love and being responsive to their own selves so that they can be empathic towards others and ultimately to the, towards themselves. And that's why it's so key to establish safety. So when disciplining and setting limits, uh, this is about preparation. So the parent conveys that there's a limit that needs to be set, and they're open and confident, they're clear, and they are clear in what they want and what the consequence is. And the focus Daniel Hughes talks about is not to elicit agreement. That's not the result, but rather to give the child the information so that they can make sense of the decision. Because he says, again, it's about prominence. If the focus is on the agreement, this, way mil this will communicate a fear of differences and conflicts and generate more confusion for the child. Because what if the child cannot, cannot complete the limit? What if the child cannot do what the parent asks them to do in that moment because it's overwhelming for them? the child then will become more confused. It's rather the parent is giving the child the information about the limit and seeing how the child responds and staying attuned and addressing those concerns from there. So the parent should be open to her child's perspective to convey her confidence in herself while still knowing her child's wishes. And this is hearing the child's point of view. Maybe the child has some thoughts about what the limit is, and that's okay for a parent to hear the child's intentions, thoughts, feelings, process about a limit that's being set. That actually elicits more cooperation from the child. When the child feels heard by the parent, the child will, be, will hear the parent. And that is really the core about attachment parenting. When we, when we really hear our children and understand their concerns, their fears, their thoughts, their feelings, they are more able to cooperate and hear our thoughts, our concerns, our limits, and be able to do them willingly. So number three is the parent is wise to convey their decision with empathy for the frustration and conflict likely to occur betwe between what the child wants and her decision. And children do need understanding and comfort over their distress. Most always, we all don't like limits. We have to anticipate the upset. Children, no matter what, don't like limits. So we have to know that there's going to be distress, and we're going to be there with the child in the distress and help comfort them. So let's move on to the next page and talk about the importance of understanding guilt and shame. And this is really, really important. And I know I've talked a little bit about the shame. So I want you to imagine that shame is like a bubble 
that a child surrounds themselves in. They can't see past it, and the way it is exhibited to the world is with the sense of helplessness. Uh, there's a sense of worthlessness. <clears throat> a lot of children will say, I'm stupid, I'm dumb, you don't love me, nobody wants me. If your child is exhibiting those types of behaviors, they do, they are experiencing a state of shame. So let me talk about what shame is and how important it is for us to understand. Shame is directed towards the self, and shame experiences the self as bad, worthless, and unlovable. Now let's think about this. Given that shame is about the self, the person, the child, feels that there is little that they can do to fix it. And since they are not able to change this core, because it is a core, and as a result, what we see is they will deny their behavior. They will lie, make excuses, and blame others. And when those efforts fail, and the person, maybe a parent, or a teacher who's getting them to focus on this shameful behavior will cause them to become enraged. And what happens is these kids have excessive shame, and we're not understanding that we have to acknowledge the shame and help them come out of it. But first we have to join them in that shame. Excessive shame, and this is quoted from Daniel Hughes's book, prevents the development of guilt. And when experienced, it prevents the child from accepting responsibility for their actions. Individuals who are rated high on measures of shame are rated low on measures of empathy. And this is really important to understand because I have a lot of parents who say, he can't take responsibility. You know, he has no empathy. That tells me we're dealing with a child who has pervasive shame. They feel stuck. They can't get out of it. They can't see past their own view, and it's not their fault. What we need to do is go in there and focus on their strengths and vulnerabilities, where we're going to, and help them see their experience in a different way so that they can see others. Because if, if a child can't experience their own experience, there's no way they're going to experience someone else's experience. Because what guilt is, it, guilt is directed towards behavior. Guilt is about we feel distressed about someone else for doing something to someone else. We think about the other. And individuals who experience guilt on a daily basis when they're wrong, they are rated high on measures of empathy. And so it's just important to really understand if your child is in a state of shame and just recognize that. Because a lot of parents, and there's parents out there who talk about, um, you know, I always have my child say I'm sorry when they do something wrong. If you, if you know your child is experiencing a lot of shame, I encourage, uh, I encourage you not to have them say I'm sorry because actually saying I'm sorry will actually cause them more shame. And what we want to do is teach the child to understand their behavior in a new way and also model for them through our own behaviors how to apologize. And then they'll be able to develop guilt and think through problems and see another's perspective. So let's move on to focusing on strengths. And the reason why uh, Daniel Hughes talks about focusing on strengths and vulnerabilities is because, again, what we pay attention to grows bigger, will become more prominent. And a lot of these kids, if they're living in a state of shame, they're not able to see the goodness within them. They're not able to understand that, wow, I can really do something. I can be proud about something. I can control myself. I have courage, all positive aspects of the self, because we really want to help them focus not on the negative aspects but on the positive. So here are some examples for you 
And the way you focus on a strength is you say, you really seem to want to help your friend out. You're telling them what you see within them. Well, you showed great honesty in facing that. Well, you seem so proud about what you just did. We're seeing them for themselves because they cannot see themselves. So we're expressing that for them. Wow, your friend is really important to you. Great job to control your anger when you are mad at me. And if you notice anything, and I know it's hard sometimes if we're feeling dysregulated and upset with our children, but to really find the little, the little pieces that you notice in your child and pull them out slowly and point them out to the child. Boy, you really want to get good at that. So it's reframing something negative into something positive. Like, for instance, um, children, when they get frustrated, say they're trying to do blocks or um, put together a car or do Legos, and they get really frustrated. But you recognize that they worked really hard, and they persevered, and then they got frustrated, and they may have thrown their car. In traditional parenting, what would we focus on? The throwing of the car, and we would correct them. In attachment-focused parenting, we're going to focus on the strength in that. Wow, you really worked hard on that Lego. I was watching you, and I could see you were working really hard. I'm proud of you. Then you would come and say, and I can see you are, were really mad about that. It's frustrating. I'm going to tell the child the experience that I experienced with them, and then I can set a limit. You know, next time when you're really, really upset, you could say, I'm really, really mad, as opposed to stop throwing the car, you're not listening, go to your room, or you're not going to play with this car anymore. Attachment-focused parenting is about really helping a child understand their experience. So moving on to focusing on vulnerabilities is another way of teasing out the child's emotional life for them and really honoring and respecting that they are emotional, that children with trauma histories are hypersensitive, life will be harder, life is difficult, and that we want to help them bring that out and understand it with them that we can transform it, but we have to recognize it. And I talk a lot about joining a child's grief uh, because grief is another big part, really understanding that your child is grieving the losses previous to being adopted or being in your foster home. That we're recognizing that it's okay to have these feelings. And if we can't do it for our children then it's important for us to understand how do we do it for ourselves. And really it comes down to being compassionate and having your own self-empathy. So practice these tools on yourself and then see how you can practice these tools on your children. Because again, what we're giving our children, we need to be able to give ourselves too. So vulnerabilities might sound like, and I use this phrase a lot, it is so hard for you when You can't do something. You can't do that. I know it's hard to find the right words, especially kids that have difficulty expressing their emotional life, and we don't want to put pressure on them, but we do want to encourage them to put words to their feelings. I see how hard it is to find the right words. Well, you really are hard on yourself when you do something wrong. You seem to be so confused right now. Nothing seems to be going right for you lately. Sometimes you get so upset it seems to ruin your whole day. I see that a lot, Um, that black and white thinking. What we're also doing with focusing on vulnerabilities, we're helping them be, and I talk about this a lot, in the ambiguity of life. And what's so important about that is we are able to tolerate our experience. It's, I think our society is, is very black and white in our thinking that we either fix, rescue, stop, 
emotion. Whereas attachment-focused parenting really encourages us to be present, be in the not knowing place, ha- have that not knowing place be alive. And it takes a lot of self-strength to do that and to be comfortable in your own states of ambiguity so that you can model that for your child and be with theirs. So focusing on vulnerabilities, we all have vulnerabilities. And I think society tells us it's not okay to be vulnerable. But you know what? It takes great strength and resilience to be vulnerable. And it's so important to show these kids through our modeling that you can have feelings about something. Things can be difficult in life, but we're not going to fall to pieces. We're here with each other, and we're going to work through it together. And that's attachment focus. So I highly encourage you to, to try this, these tools on yourself and then use them with your children. Um, you look so discouraged. I feel sad for you since you wanted that so much. If a child isn't able to get something that they really worked hard on. Um, when I got angry before, you seemed worried that I stopped caring for you. And again, when I talked about tone earlier, tone, uh, an angry tone by a parent, the child is going to take it personally, as we hear a lot. You know, he takes what I say so personally. That's an indication you have a child who's in a pervasive state of shame because they will interpret in their bubble, mommy is mad at me, not my behavior. So I'm going to talk a little bit more um, in the next page about intersubjectivity. And why don't I start here because I just talked about that. When parents, when we get angry at our children, which is normal and it's okay and it happens, with children who have shame, when we get angry at them, it's important for us to know, to pay attention to where our anger is directed. Because, again, their interpretation is the anger will be directed towards them. So we want to be able to say, you know what, I can differentiate the child from their behavior. So it's saying to them, you know, I'm angry that you made a choice to lose your cell phone. I'm really disappointed in your choice. I'm not disappointed in you as a person. I love you. I'm just not happy with the choice you made. That would be for a teenager. You know, it really hurt me when you lied to me before because I love you and I wish, is there something that I'm doing that is not helping you feel safe so you can tell me the truth? because I love you and I want to be close to you and it hurts me that you don't feel safe in telling me the truth, that you're not letting me get close to you. So really focusing on the behavior, not on the child with a negative tone, being angry and disappointed with the choice. Uh, Okay, so the next page is about being open to a child's anger. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about Brian Post and Beyond Consequences because I love what he talks about, which is that there are two primary primary emotions, which is love and fear. Um, The reason why I'm bringing that up is because anger is an expression of that fear. And anger is a really important emotion and for children to have, especially with trauma histories, because they have all this pent up, these pent up feelings. And typically, kids who have experienced grief, grief is exhibited with anger. Why? Because grief, to experience grief, you have to be vulnerable. And anger is a defense against pain. So we will see a lot of these kids are very angry. and But if we really look beneath the behavior, we'll see that underneath that is a lot of grief, shame, and a fear of being vulnerable, and a fear of feeling that pain. So I, I just want to give you that perspective so we can see anger as not something we don't want. It's an expression 
of something that we want to help them understand and interpret for them. And see that a child's anger is valid. Um, and though there are limits within anger and how it's expressed, very, very important. You know, a child can't just throw toys or throw cups or plates when they're angry. There is a limit um, and teaching them what they can do in order to express that anger is very important. Um, I, I do a lot of, and something that I use a lot of is when you see behavior, you you say exactly that. I see you are really mad. I hear you are really mad. You work through the senses. I see you. I hear you. I get it. And we'll talk about that, how to use the tools of PACE, P-A-C-E, which was developed by Daniel Hughes, which are four ways to set limits, join your child's experience, and be with them. Um, so when you're seeing a child's anger, you say, whoa, whoa, I, I see you're really mad. C can you tell me I'm mad right now? Because I, I see you just threw that truck, and it's not okay to throw trucks, but it's okay to say I'm really mad right now. With these kids, they need a lot of direction. They need to be told, given a choice of what to do. It's not um, we're saying it so that they comply. We're giving them options so that they can get their needs met and, get, and express themselves in a safe way, not only for us, but for themselves. So when emotions are allowed this full range of expression, they become better defined and integrated, and it is an, enables more of an attachment with the caregivers. So if, if a child is inhibiting their anger, then the relationship will become less safe. So we want to understand and be in their bubble, whatever experience that is. Um, it is common, uh, I think, today to confuse the emotion of anger with angry behavior. And this is a big point that I see a lot. Um, uh, I've had a lot of families come to me and say, you know, he's very disrespectful. Um, and I say, okay, um, I'm sensing that there's a lot of shame going on. And what they're saying is I can't regulate my feelings. I have difficulty expressing myself and they're not able to be reflective and they don't know how to express or repair a relationship. So what happens is when a parent says, you know, they're being disrespectful, this, and Daniel Hughes talks about this, is our way of creating a negative judgment of, your, of a child. And what happens is it's our own blueprint. For us to see a child's behavior as disrespectful, that's our own blueprint of how we were parented. Because we cannot foster parent and, uh, adopted children. We cannot um, parent foster and adopted children t traditionally. And judging them will create more anger and more frustration and more distance and distrust. So we really need to be careful of our own negative judgments and be able to reframe for ourselves, wow, my child's really angry right now and doesn't know how to regulate this affect or express it in a positive manner. So it's really stopping and seeing this differently. It's a new paradigm and a different way of thinking. But once you can really understand and see in my explanation today, why anger is valid, and what it's really communicating, I'm so frightened to even feel any pain and be vulnerable with you because will you be able to be vulnerable with my pain? It's frightening. So if we're not comfortable with our own feelings about anger and vulnerability, then we're not going to be able to stay connected. We're going to continue to see them as disrespectful, which is not going to keep the relationship safe, and create more of a negative cycle. And it's really hard if we get stuck in that place. Um, it's really hard to get out of it. So it's really important as a parent to go, you know what, I'm going to try something different. 
And I really encourage all of you to try what I'm giving you today and see how it works for you. And it's a process, and these are not quick fixes, and this is about process, and the results will come and you'll see it through the relationship because you'll see your child more regulated, more able to come forward to you and feel more safe, and you'll feel more connected. So um, because anger, a child's expression of anger does not represent failure of a parent's inability to discipline. You know, anger is important. If anger is eliciting doubt and shame in a parent, then sometimes what parents will do is they'll rescue the child, just like I was talking about. We'll fix it. We'll stop it. Because in our society, anger is not okay. But with these kids, they have a lot of anger. And we need to help them through the anger to get to the core issues of the fear and the pain and the grief and the loss. So here's an example. Um, the child says, I think that you're mean. And the parent says, you think that's why I said no? This is the parent setting a limit. I'm a mean mom. The child says, yeah, you are. The parent says, oh, I'm sorry you think that. That would make it hard to feel close to me right now, really hard. The child says, I don't want to be close to you. The parent said, that's what I thought. You want to handle it all by yourself. That's that shame. The child says, I do. Why can't I? The parent says, I can see that you really, really want to. The child will slowly calm down. Why? Because they felt heard. They weren't corrected. You can't feel that. You're being disrespectful. Stop that. The parent joined the child in the experience, allowed the expression, and helped regulate it and make sense of it with the child. So... Um, that's an ex explanation of how to be open to a child's anger. Um, let's see. And I think I talked earlier before about it's the manner in which we model our own feelings of anger and share them with our children. That is so important because when we are able to share our own feelings with our children, then we model for them that it's okay to have feelings. And actually, when we're modeling our feelings and then, and then being open to their re feelings, we are then building a shared respect. And that is where you are going to get respect, and it will turn that disrespect into a mutual, reciprocal relationship of cooperation. I mean, that is the end goal. Uh, and you can start attachment-focused parenting as early as the baby. You know, you have a baby. Um, but typically I know we get children in foster care and adoption later. You start it as soon as possible, putting these tools into effect. So let's move on to the next page, which are Samuel Hughes' Core Tools of PACE, which is, stands for P-A-C-E. And P stands for playfulness, A stands for acceptance, C stands for curiosity, and E stands for empathy. And these tools he recommends using any time you want to set limits, any time you see a child's expression of an emotion, any, any time you want to influence your child in any way, um, so these tools can be used in a matter of in many situ different situations. So let's start with playfulness. Playfulness. Oh, and let me just backtrack. The tools of pace. These are attitudes. And a tool that I give my parents um, in my private practice is, if you're getting really dysregulated by your child. I want you to step back and see your child as a client, like a work cli uh, a client at work. It will help you build a boundary and separate and be able to be more objective and attuned to your child. So, if so, using these tools as you would use with a client. So, and you would do this with your own child. So, an attitude of playfulness 
is all of these actually represent ways of setting boundaries with our children. So an attitude of playfulness is having humor, um, being lightness, being light and open, having laughter. Laughter in attachment work builds memories in any form of attachment. When we have laughter, we build a memory about an event. And then that creates a new synapse in our brain, and it creates a new experience. And what a lot of these kids do not have are happy memories. So this is a way of instilling new memories in their, in their brains. So it's building an unconditional acceptance of each other. You know, it's important for us as parents to laugh at ourselves and admit mistakes openly and not be so hard on ourselves. You know, we're all trying to do the best that we can. And it's really letting go and accepting, I'm going to give this a try, I'm going to have self-empathy, and I'm going to go for it. And if, if I mess up, I'm okay. I'm not, I don't have to feel ashamed about this. I can be I can still feel good about myself and admit that I've made a mistake. And that's a parent's way of differentiating the behavior from the person. And I'm going to talk more about that in acceptance. So, it's important to keep an open mind and suspend judgment about a child's motives for his behavior, like I talked about earlier. This will enable a parent to explore the child's perspective rather than assuming the child was just being defiant. So here's an example from the book. The parent says, you know, I noticed the grass isn't cut. You know, tell me about that. What's up? The child said, well, there wasn't any gas in the can. The parent says, hmm, he decides to be playful in his response. Didn't I tell you if you ran out of gas to use scissors? The parent says, Wow. And then the child complies and is able to set the limit and complete uh, whatever was asked of him. If a parent um, notices that a child is very reactive in their response, the parent can be playful in saying, here's another example, getting that response when I asked you to bake a pie makes me glad I didn't ask you to do the dishes. Saying something playful to alter the mood. And there's a lot of talk about oxytocin right now and how the brain shifts when oxytocin gets released from the brain. That's what we're doing here. We are shifting the brain from cortisol to oxytocin because what that does, it enables the child to stay connected rather than disconnected. Because when a child's in a state of stress, they're not able to stay connected. So this is a great way, being playful, to keep the child connected, even in setting limits. Another tool that I use is, um, especially with younger kids, is everything in your world has a life, down to the pen, down to the cell phone, down to your glass. So if a child's acting out with a toy, w with a, an object, say they have a pen and they're they begin writing on your table, which you know at that point oh, it's causing you to dysregulate and you need to stop this behavior. So we identify that the pen is having a lot of big feelings, and we set limits with the pen and say, boy, that pen needs a time out right now. It's a playful way of establishing a limit, stopping the negative behavior, setting a limit, and getting the child out of that acting out behavior. So, wow, that pen is having a lot of feelings right now. He needs a break. He needs to go sit down and relax right now. I'm going to help him. Let's help this pen. It, with little kids, and even up to the age of six and seven, it works so effectively, this type of playful parenting. And there's a wonderful book called Playful Parenting, which gives you many ideas to do because uh, it actually enhances, again, the attachment. So let's move on to acceptance. Uh, I see we have about 15 more minutes of this lecture, and then I will open up the call for questions. 
So, uh, so acceptance is the second attitude of pace. And this is accepting the child completely. It, it's not about accepting the behavior completely if we're not in alignment with what the child is doing, but always accepting the child. Because, again, if we're dealing with shame, the child needs to know that they are loved. And if they get a sense that they are not loved, then they will, it will create that perpetual cycle for them. So acceptance, uh, he talks about, has nothing to do with permissiveness. Behaviors remain to be evaluated and limited. Parents continue to set limits and direct the behavior by focusing their teaching on the behavior, but the teaching is not on the child. That is a form of correction, and that is traditional parenting. That is stopping behavior as opposed to teaching new ways of behaving. So accepting is understanding a child's behavior represents the child's best effort at the time, that the child is doing the best that they can. We, as parents, may disagree with the choice. We may accept the intention of the choice, but we may not agree with the behavior, and we're going to help them with that. That their behavior is an indication of their distress. And Beyond Consequences talks about this a lot, that children act out not because they want attention. It is because they need attention. And that is where acceptance is. I accept my child, and I accept his behavior, and I will help him if I don't agree with the behavior. I will help him find other ways to express what is underneath that behavior, the meaning of it. So um, parents, it's important to have confidence in the child's inner life. When confidence is undermined, the parents' own doubts about their parenting abilities may elicit their own shame. And, you know, this is hard work, and I'm encouraging you to try these new tools today and there are going to be times when it doesn't work or, it, you know, you try one attitude of pace and, up oh, that one didn't work. Let me try another one. And, and it's not working. And knowing that right now I'm in preparation mode, I'm practicing, it's going to take time. So knowing that you are doing the best that you can so that you don't elicit your own shame because then it will make it harder for you as a parent to communicate the acceptance of your own child. We will then project our own shame onto our child, that they're not effective when we're not feeling effective. But we are effective. We just need to learn the tools and ways of influencing so that we do feel effective. And this is going to take practice, and I can tell you I do this in my own parenting, and I cannot tell you and I am a testimonial of Daniel Hughes, and I this is so effective. I have never forced my child to say I'm sorry. I have modeled all the time when I have uh, expressed my own feelings in a negative tone that impacted his core self, and I was able to apologize and model and reflect to him, I'm sorry that Mommy yelled. That's not okay. He has now, my own child, who's almost five, he now is able to apologize on his own. And it took a lot of me stepping down from my own traditional parenting and really understanding how important it was for me to respect him so that he could learn how to respect and then cooperate with me when I set limits. And it really, these tools actually make parenting more fun. And, you know, having a child with a trauma history is not always fun. And we are going to feel our child's loss with them. So we do need to find ways to really be able to have that positive relationship with our child because uh, it's so important to maintain that connection. And really these kids want that. They do so desire it, and there is this baggage that they don't want either. And they're just trying to figure it out too. And how do I express this? How do I let this go? So our modeling is only going to help them be able to learn how to have positive attachments. 
So um, number four in acceptance is that acceptance is undermined when anger is expressed as by the parent as intense or lasting. And I talked about this before about tone, that if the tone is towards the child, the tone, the safety will be broken. A child will then test the relationship to see if the parent accepts them. We hear this over and over and over with these kids. They're always testing me. They're always testing me. Because what they're doing is they're testing to see, does my parent accept me? Do they really love me? Or are they going to give me away like, in their perspective, my birth family gave me away or my foster family? Are they really going to do that? So they're going to test you, and they're going to test you with your tone to see that you're able to differentiate the child from the behavior, that you're going to be able to say, you know what, I love you. I don't love that you threw your car at your brother. That they can see that, wow, I am loved. I am worthy, and I am important, and I am important to my parent, and that is what matters in all of this parenting. Again, avoid negative judgments about the child's thoughts, emotions, and intentions. Um, Here's an example of a parent judging. And listen to my tone in how I accent the phrasing here. So the phrase is, you took that money because you always want your way. I'm going to say it in a parent judging tone. You took that money because you always want your way. A child's going to hear It's all about them. They're not loved. They're bad. They did something wrong. The core self, the way a parent can reframe that and be the non-judgmental tone. You know, I'm angry that you took that money. Using an I message. Being soft yet clear and talking about behavior. Not the child. Uh, Okay, so the next page, we will move on to curiosity, and curiosity is the third attitude of pace, and that is having a non-judgmental, not knowing stance that requires a parent to inquire about the child's inner life that led to the behavior. Curiosity is actually a wonderful tool. Once you're able to really feel curious Your tone changes. There's such a safety that gets developed in the relationship. And and you'll you'll feel a change as a parent, too. As opposed to asking questions to elicit information, the curiosity elicits more space in the relationship, which actually elicits more safety. And really, the child is able to tell you more. It's a fascinating... um, tool here because it really works on a lot of issues in building attachment with attachment challenged children. So the child needs to feel safe that his inner life is not criticized. Again, that bubble, you're not going to criticize my inner world. If so, the child will hide their motives and not be able to modify their behavior. They'll lie, they'll deny, they'll hide it because they don't feel that that it's safe to express it because if they do express it, I'll be criticized. That's what lying is about. That's shame. So curiosity invites the resistance. And intersubjectivity, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, now let's see. We didn't, actually we missed intersubjectivity. How did that happen? We're going to go to the third page after we go through these tools. Okay, so uh, here we are, curiosity. So curiosity invites the resistance into intersubjectivity. So the curiosity is asking questions such as, what do you think about that? If you do that, what do you expect to happen next? Uh, Tell me about that. You know, what do you want to happen? What do you need right now? And number four, there are 
there are five basic human needs that I take from nonviolent parenting, which is that we all have needs of attention, affection, appreciation, autonomy, and acceptance. And so being able to ask a child, you know, do you need my attention right now? Do you need a hug? Do you need some space? Do you need me to listen? I'm right here. So really honoring that internal life of the child and being curious about it. Now the next tool is empathy. Empathy can be verbal and nonverbal. And if you don't already know, 90% of communication is nonverbal. And empathy must be conveyed with both nonverbal and verbal expression. And that's with tone, eye contact, facial expression, touch, and on my website, I talk more about nonverbal communication. Uh, I have a little video on YouTube which clearly talks about how to have safe nonverbal communication. So you can look at that after the call if you'd like. Um, the second part of empathy is the parent does not rescue the child from the situation or solve the problem for them. They stay with them in the ambiguity. They convey, they convey with the child that they are capable of managing the situation, even though it is hard. So it's really about instilling trust in the child, you know. And so here are some phrases where a child may say, you know, I don't, I don't think you care about me. And a parent may respond, wow, if you think that I don't care, that must be so hard for you. And I use that phrase a lot, that must be so hard for you. Um, the second one could be, I feel sad that you experience me as not caring. And it is really hard, and you're doing it and struggling with it. This is really hard, and you're showing a lot of strength. That is a way of pointing out and being empathic and then showing a strength in there, focusing on a strength. I know this is really hard. We will get through this. I, I love this next uh, empathy phrase, which is, this is not your problem. This is our problem. And the last one, I wonder if it is ever hard for you to carry so much of your thoughts all by yourself. And again, if we think of that bubble, we think of these kids, they are just holding on to all this within themselves and so afraid to let it out. So it's our job to create that safety and have empathy so that they can let it out and express it. And I just realized, and that's the four tools of PACE, that we skipped a page. And I'm so sorry about that, and that is intersubjectivity. Now, some people have page numbers and some do not. So I, from the first page, your title page, it's one, two, three page three. Let me see here. No, actually, it is four. So you've got your title page, one, two, three, four. The fifth page, we did not do this page, which is the title is The Importance of Intersubjectivity. Now, I want to go over this because this is really important Daniel Hughes talks about this in how do we join a child in their, I've been talking about, their bubble. Experience it with them, match their affective state, and explore the experience to make sense of it for them. So the way this is done is through attunement. And the way he helps parents learn how to attune to their child's affect, their child's behavior, their child's expression, is to match the rhythm and intensity of the meaning of the behavior by which it is experienced and expressed. And I'm going to go into this without acting it out. So it is what it really is, is about mirroring and reflecting. So the child may say, no one ever listens to me. And the parent says, no one? How hard that must be if it seems no one listens to you. You see how I matched the rhythm and intensity of the expression. 
it is a great way to regulate a child. And I always use this example. Just think when you call a friend and something just happened that was terrible, maybe someone cut you off or you just got a ticket, and you call your friend on the phone and you go, you know, I just got a ticket and it's just terrible and I have to pay at $300. And the person on the other line matches your rhythm, matches your intensity and says, oh, that's terrible. I'm so sorry that happened. What happens is you calm down, you feel heard, you feel experienced. It is such a great way to maintain that connection. When you, re when you reflect the rhythm and intensity that your child expresses and projects at you, you, project, you don't project it back, you reflect it back. So part two of intersubjectivity is focusing on the same event. So an event may be the parent is saying, put your clothes away. The child doesn't listen. The parent responds in frustration. Pay attention to what I'm saying. The parent has not stayed connected to the event. The parent has made the focus something else now, which now could be more prominent. You're not paying attention to what I'm saying. The child might make that more prominent. Well, I'm not going to pay attention to what you're saying. It's almost like we invite the resistance. We create a negative feedback loop. Whereas if we stay with the event, we tell the child, put your clothes away, and the child's watching TV, we join the child at the television. We join the event and go, wow, I see you're watching TV. What are you watching? We join their experience, and then we, we move through and help them to complete the task and go, well, you know, it's time for us to put our clothes away. How, how can we make this happen? Tell me. Where we have a dialogue, we have a discussion. You're telling me it's hard to turn off the TV. I can see how hard it is for you. Would you like me to turn off the TV or would you like to turn off the TV? I'm helping the child learn how to transition. I'm connected to the event and I'm sharing their affect. They may say, I don't want to turn off the TV. I hear that you don't want to turn off the TV. It's hard to turn off the TV. I've used two tools of pace. I reflected back their experience, and then I empathized with how hard it is to turn off the TV. So I'm using these tools so the child feels heard, cooperated with, with their emotional life, and then they're more able to cooperate and hear what I'm asking them to do. So the, the third part of intersubjectivity is shared intentions regarding the activity together, and that's enjoying each other, communicating interest in the same event. This is central in the development of cooperation. And what's important about that is when we really share and join in our child's experience, it is much easier to transition. To transition. It, it is much easier to influence them. So how do you do that, joining the experience? Um, if the emotion is intense and the event is too overwhelming, we join the child's experience by seeing and reflecting and receiving the cues that the child is giving us. Boy, you really seem so sad that you can't go to your friend's house because maybe you've set a limit that it's homework time. We can't go to our friend's house. You look so sad. You look kind of confused. You're expressing to the child what you're seeing. You're joining in their inner life. You really looked excited about getting that right. Boy, you really sound angry now. How hard that seems for you. And what it is, and I say this a lot, is adoptees and foster children really need a lot of being seen, heard, and received. Why? because there is a psychological component to foster and adoptive children when they have been separated from their biological families, which I have a lot of personal knowledge about, is that there's a part of us that feels that we don't exist. There's a part of us that has died, a part of us that is not at our disposal. It's not present. 
so it feels like it's alien. And we internalize that, and what happens, what's important is for us to have that recognition. We are seen. We are heard. And that, that is, if we could say, the special need of adopted and children, uh, adopted and foster children, that our emotional life needs to be recognized. And, you know, this cannot be done enough because what's going to happen is children, when they have that reflection over and over and over, that's the investment and that will help in their healing. Then they will be more able to see, hear, and receive their own experiences. And truly what this is all about is helping kids learn to be present in their own minds, help them make their own informed decisions on their own two feet, and make choices for themselves. And that, that, that's going to take time, and it takes us really reaching into their bubble and being and joining with them and having that experience with them. So I'm so sorry that I missed that page. People probably got confused. Um, so let's just go to the end of PACE, which is the second, the second to last page of your handout is, I'll go over this quickly so we can, because we have 15 more minutes, do Q&A. And that's regulating shameful feelings. And that is, it's, it's helpful. It is not helpful to argue with a child when they say that they're stupid. Uh, you could say something like, it must be hard if you think you're bad. So regulating with empathy, you really seem to be hard on yourself. And then you could lean the empathy towards questions of curiosity. And just so you know, the four tools of PACE, P-A-C-E, are interchangeable. You don't have to do them in that order. You can do empathy first and then be curious, just like in this how to regulate shameful feelings. The importance of initiating repair, this is really important. When there has been a break in communication, say, you know, everyone was yelling and um, everyone was dysregulated, the parent and the child, so they could not connect. And maybe they both went to two different rooms. It is important for the parent to initiate a new experience with that child, to join with that child. If we wait for the child, it will literally take years. These children, because they don't understand guilt, they're not able to see another's perspective, they need us to go in and show it and be directed with them. And that is acknowledging and understanding and having empathy for the distress and let them know that what happened was really scary. And that's the parent's way of using an iMessage, coming back, communicating to the child with nonverbal or verbal communication. You know, that that was a really hard time we just had. And I'm so sorry, it was hard for me to stay connected. I had a lot of big feelings. Modeling for kids, that you know what, sometimes it is hard to stay with your feelings, and I get that. Um, and it is crucial that a parent does not believe that they're responsible for eliminating distress in the child's life. You know, distress is important and a necessary part of life. And it is distress associated with unmet wishes, not unmet needs, which will facilitate a child's coping skills. So we're really going to be able to teach kids coping skills by being with them in the distress. If we are distressed, we leave, we come back, we offer them a new way of coping and connecting. Um, there's one more part of this that I think is important, and that, yes, number nine, the importance of initiating repair, and that is coming back to your child after there's been uh, a lot of yelling or screaming or a lot of disconnection. The parent accepts the responsibility for initiating repair. If the parent insists, they are communicating that the child is responsible for the continuity of the relationship. So we're not waiting for a child to come to us. 
because then the child will think that the relationship is not important to her and be unlikely to have the confidence to take the first step, which will lead to a downward spiral spiral of negative distancing. Or if he does not initiate repair, he may experience resentment that he had to be good and be sorry before his parent would welcome him again into her mind and heart. And Daniel Hughes talks about that, that it's so important that we tell that our communication conveys to the child, this relationship is important to me, and it's my job to repair and initiate the repair because you are worth it. You are important, and you're important to me. And that is when a child feels that, they will break through that shame and join and attach. So I'm very excited. Uh, We went through the handout. I know that was a lot. So what I'm going to do right now is open up the call for Q&A. So that means you will press star six, and I will see you come up on my queue, and we I can answer some questions. So does anyone have any questions? Please. Star six. Or maybe there's something someone wants me to talk about more. Okay, here we go. Okay, I have someone from Upland, California. Who has a question from Upland, California? Can you hear me? Oh, here. I'm having a problem with... Oh, here we go. Okay, so I'm sorry. Uh, Upland, California. Who is from Upland? Who is on the Q&A? This is Kate. Can you hear me? Kate, yes. Hi, Kate. I can hear you. Great. Okay. Um, so a question regarding discipline or... Uh, so let's say, like theoretically, my two-year-old uh, adoptive son <laughs> hits uh-huh. his sister. Um, what do I do in that situation? Because, you know, if, if he throws a toy, uh-huh. that's... It's easier to handle that in a um, in a, a connection, not correction way. But mm-hmm. if he hits his sister and she's crying, how do I communicate to the sister, I'm pre- going to protect you because what he did is wrong, um, but still remain connected to the son? His experience, yes. Okay, first I would reflect what just happened, wow, and reflect to him his emotion, his experience. So you're going to join him. Wow, you were really mad. You had a lot of big feelings. I use with little kids like that. You had a lot of big feelings with your sister, and you hit her. I noticed that. Wow, can you tell me how mad you are? See what he says. Then with your, how old is the older? Uh, they're both two. Oh, they're both, or oh, are they twins? Okay. Well, they're they're not biological twins, but they are twins in then experience. You you convey to him the experience you see in the sibling. Wow, look at how your big feelings hurt your sister. Boy, look how she's crying. So that he can understand because two year olds it's tough for them to truly understand cause and effect. They're right. not able to do it. So it's really helping him understand the experience and the impact of his behavior. And that's going to take repetition because he's only two. You're going to have to go through this experience over and over and over. But the more you're able to make sense of it, wow, I see you had a lot of big feelings with your sister. Can you tell me? Could you say I'm really mad right now? So be direct with him because he's saying I don't know how to communicate anger. Mm -hmm. but hitting her, so you're going to give him a tool, be direct with him, and then go, let's check on your sister. Look at how upset she is that you yelled, that you hit her. Boy, she's really upset. Let's see how she's doing. That way she doesn't feel abandoned in the experience. You're then comforting and nurturing her, and he's witnessing the event. 
-hmm. And then you're showing, you're modeling for him how to be empathic. Okay. And repair the relationship. And then you could also offer him, would you, is there anything you would like to do to help your sister if, if he really hurt her, like, um, and she needs an ice pack? Let's go get the ice pack for your sister. Boy, she really needs ice right now. Let's go get it. And, you know, in that moment, if he's having trouble, do something playful where maybe you pick him up really fast and go, oh, let's go get, like, an emergency. Let's be the emergency. Let's go get the ice pack. And you go get the ice pack and bring it to her. Mm-hmm. You know, like, because that age is very concrete, too. Let's be a doctor right now. She needs our help. That's where you could use something playful to teach mm-hmm. him how to care for others in not a shameful way, not making him ashamed of his behavior, but telling him, wow, you had a lot of big feelings. And let's check on your sister. Boy, look at how those feelings made her feel. What could we say to her? And if he doesn't know, you could model for him. We could say, I'm sorry I hit you. I was having big feelings. Hmm. Something uh-huh. like that. And then use. I always like to um, have the child check on the child a little bit later, too. Let's check on her boo-boo. Are you okay? So he'll understand how to nurture, how to be empathic. Because really, for two, they're still learning that, and it's going to take a, f- a good few years of all that investing you'll be doing <laughs> mm-hmm. in his ability to regulate. But does that answer your question? Yes. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you, Kate, and thank you for being with me today. I hope it's been helpful. It has. Great. Okay, so who's next here in the Q&A? I have, and I don't, I don't have a name here, but it's a 556 number. Oh, that's me. Okay, uh, uh, it's Tamar Shafitz. I'm calling from Los Angeles. Oh, hi. hi. And your name? Tamar Shafitz. Tamara. Oh, hi, mm-hmm. Tamara. Hi. Um, I had two questions, just information questions. Uh-huh. One, you had said Daniel Hughes um, wrote a book called Beyond Consequences. Um, and I went to kind of Google it, and I got something else called oh, Beyond Consequences. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I may have said that incorrectly. Uh, Beyond Consequences was written by Brian Post. Okay, I found it. Okay. And mm-hmm. Heather Forbes. And Heather Forbes. And has Daniel Hughes written a book? Oh, yes. He wrote, this training that I'm teaching you today mm-hmm. is based on his book, Attachment Focused Parenting. Okay. He's also written um, a few other books as well. And that is... Building the Bonds of Attachment, right? Yes, Building the Bonds of Attachment and a few other books. Yeah, I've got um, it on Google, like Safe Place. Yes. Okay. So he's... Building the Bonds of Attachment is a great book. Are you a foster or adoptive parent? I'm um pl- I'm going through my certification process right now to foster oh, to adopt. Oh, great. And I'm also um, taking the 10-week class at the Echo Center for nonviolent parenting. Oh, great. Yeah, so I talked a little bit about the five needs. Then it sounds very start. similar, yeah. <laughs> yes. That's great. Yes. Great. And was there another question? Um, do you give um, classes here in Los Angeles? I do. Um, I can. You can email me your email, and I'll put you on my e- email list. I have okay. an event coming up in May called the Resilient Spirit, which I do every year, which covers. Um, it's it, it brings awareness to foster care for National Foster Care Awareness Month, and then I do series of trainings throughout the year. So, just email me. You can go through my personal website, JeanetteYoff.com or Yoff Therapy, and just send me an email with your uh, email address, and I'll put you on my list. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, let's see. The third person here in the Q&A is Thomas. Thomas? Uh, Jenny Thomas? Jenny, yeah, your name is coming up as Thomas, so. Okay. Yes. In Laverne, did you say? Yes. I have a question, um, about uh, our foster son is still developing language. He's three years old, but he's really speech delayed. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the models that you gave 
sort of involve talking with the child. In our case, most of the time it's kind of talking to him, but not necessarily having him be able to respond. So, uh huh. Yeah, and I actually have some questions about how much he's even understanding of what we say. Um, I think he may have some language processing issues. So I guess how would you modify this with a child who isn't really able to engage in conversation? Well, let's think about this. Is he an adopted or foster child? He's foster right now. We're in the process okay. of moving toward adoption. Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> One of the things that I talked about was 90% of communication is nonverbal. So that's on yeah. your side. So there are sometimes I use with kids who have difficulty expressing. Um, I use a phone book, and we express by ripping up paper. And mm. you can go on journeytome.com, and I wrote an article for them. And mm-hmm. it's free, and it talks about how to join with your child's anger. And it's through ripping of a phone book. And then when the child rips up the papers, and this is all concrete and this is all what the child sees, the parent cleans it up because what's happening in that moment is the child is having a form of expression, whatever that may be. The parent is the receiver. They pick up all the pieces. They kiss the pieces. They hug the pieces. Thank you for showing me your feelings. And then you put it in a uh, pillowcase. And then you show the child that I'm going to hold on to your feelings, that you're not alone in this experience. That's one tool. Mm -hmm. Um, Because you're saying he can't verbally express, so we're going to use other tools. I use Play-Doh, pretty much like um, a mound of Play-Doh where I have the child put their fingers in the Play-Doh, squish the Play-Doh in their hand, and with your face you show them how to put the feelings and they can grunt, they can make sounds. You know, I'm really mad right now. Because he's going to see with your nonverbal communication your expression and that you're showing him how to direct it in a positive way and Mm. how to express it, that it's okay to have these feelings. And these are three things we're going to do. Rip up paper, pound on Play-Doh, and then another thing could be... um, I use the pillow, which is the child goes to the pillow and punches the pillow, um, screams into the pillow. I have kids decorate a special pillow just for their feelings. One side is is a container for the anger. The other side is a container for tears. And you could, he's three, you could have this is for sad feelings and draw a sad face. One side of the pillow and the other side of the pillow is a mad face. And on the mad side, we punch. We can punch it or we can growl. And on the sad side, we can rest our heads and cry. Mm. Those are three tools for you. See how they work and email me and let me know how it goes. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Is that helpful? Mm -hmm. Yes, very. Okay, great. Yeah, and read that article. Um, Yeah, I would really just help him find ways to release it in a more um, physical way and mm-hmm. and always conveying to him that if I see it's hard to find the right words, I'm, I'm here with you. I'm not giving up. I see you're having feelings and I'm not... Even though you may not think he's hearing you, he may be picking up pieces. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. if you're conveying a tone of I'm with you, I'm not frustrated at you because you can't communicate... I'm with you, and I'm not going to give up. Hmm. We'll help him through this time, because it sounds like it is hard for him to communicate, and that must be so frustrating for him. Yeah. Um, So to have empathy for just that experience with him Mm -hmm. um, would be really helpful for him so that he can work through this time right now, process his experience without feeling ashamed that he can't communicate because it must be hard. Yeah. Um, Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, I think you're the last call, last question. Anyone else have a question? 
Now the last page of your handout, I just gave you some tips for keeping your peace of mind while you're doing this work. Um, there's 11 tips here to help you regulate your own affect so that you can stay connected with your child. And I want to thank you all for being on this call with me today. I hope it's been helpful. I know it's a lot of information. Um, and think about it, process it, uh, try it. I wish you great luck. It is highly effective, and it's about the process, not the result. So um, just want to say also that um, a woman asked earlier, will I be doing other trainings? I'm going to do, I also have interventions like I just gave uh, Jenny for her three-year-old. I'm going to have a, four interventions for that build attachment within the family, and that will be on June 2nd, and that will be another teleclass. And you'll also receive a handout of a how to um, do the interventions with your child and family. So, again, I thank you for being with me today. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me at yoftherapy.com. Uh, take care, and I will talk to you uh, on a call in a few months. Okay, take care. Bye-bye, everyone.